Hey, Franco. What's up, man? Uh, nothing much. Nice watch. Oh, thanks. How's the NBA channel going? Um, pretty good. Pretty good. Same old. I'm, uh, I'm actually, my next video is going to be about TJ Warren. TJ Warren. The guy on the stunts. Yeah. <laughs> Is anyone going to watch that? Uh, probably not. Don't you need the views though? Yeah, I do need the views. Man, that's mm. tough. I guess you could clickbait though. I guess I could. But how would you even clickbait for a video about TJ Warren? Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I got it! Oh my god, I got it! Alright, I'll talk to you later. See ya! What's up guys? Mike here! <laughs> If you feel betrayed by the fact that I clickbaited you, um, I'm sorry, but I have a lot to say about TJ Warren and I need people to hear it. His career has gotten almost no national media coverage and whatever attention his team gets goes all towards Devin Booker and now the number one overall pick, DeAndre Ayton. But TJ Warren has developed quite nicely these last five years and this season, he's added the most valuable skill any player in today's league can have, which is the three-point shot. And he's shooting threes at a very high clip. So, like the title suggests, Steph Curry with a 40-inch vertical. Well, minus the 40-inch uh, vertical part. So, I guess TJ Warren's just Steph Curry. <laughs> TJ Warren, at least in my eyes, has slotted himself firmly into the Suns' nucleus, and if the Suns are ever to become a competitive team, I should think that Warren will play a big role in that as well. And we're gonna talk about all of that in this video. But before we begin, I'd first like to thank Vincero for sponsoring today's video. In the age of smartphones, less people are wearing watches now, mostly because you can just check the time with this, but at least in my opinion, nothing beats the aesthetic of an actual watch. And as we all know, if you don't wear a watch, you're not a real man. All right, now this is the watch I used to wear. You've probably seen me wear these in uh, my videos. I got these off of Amazon. Um, it's a nice minimalist design. I mean, the strap broke off within like two weeks. <laughs> so I guess you, you get what you pay for. But this, this is a whole different ball game, man. This is like, this is like Kwame Brown, right? And this is like Kwame Brown with a 40 inch vertical. <laughs> in all seriousness, the level of detail in these watches is pretty amazing, especially given the price. I personally don't like the, the jewelry type watches that people wear just to show off how much money they have. Like, especially if you're not an athlete or celebrity, it's very hard to pull that off non-ironically. This to me strikes a nice balance. It's still very classy, it feels and looks like very quality work. You can wear it to both formal and casual occasions, all for a very, very good price. So if you're at all interested in getting a watch, make sure to click the link down below. You can head to their website where you get a 50% discount with my promo code MDJ. So check that out before you go. Okay, let's talk about TJ Warren. TJ Warren was drafted in 2014 with the 14th overall pick, the same draft class as Andrew Wiggins. And while Andrew Wiggins' career has gotten like that, TJ Warren's has gone like this. His rookie year, he bounced between the G League and the NBA. In the summer after his rookie year, he dominated the summer league, averaging 22 points per game. In his second year, he started getting consistent minutes. In his third year, he became a starter. In his fourth year, he averaged almost 20 points per game. And this season, while his per game numbers have dipped slightly, he's a much better player than last year because he started shooting threes. He's now shooting 42.8% on threes, attempting 4.2 per game. And this is a guy who could not shoot threes at all coming into the league. He was a career 28% three-point shooter before this season. When analyzing a player's career, what I like to look for is improvements. The reason why Andrew Wiggins gets so much crap, other than the fact that he's trash, is that he's shown very little improvement since coming into the league. With other young players who have developed well, like Giannis, for example, you can trace back year by year and see how they added different parts to their game as the years go by. With Giannis, you can see, oh look, year four, he 
bulked up a lot. In year three, he worked on his handles. Look at year five, his passing is so much better than it was back in year two or in his rookie year. You can make these sort of tangible deductions just by watching them on film. And that consistent progress is something you also see in TJ Warren. It takes a lot of work to build a 28% three-point shooter to a 40% three-point shooter. So that alone tells me what I need to know about TJ Warren's willingness to improve. So let's dive deeper into TJ Warren as a player. He's about six foot eight, moderately built, six foot 10 wingspan, which is actually a below average height to wingspan ratio in the NBA. He's a slightly above average athlete at first glance. I mean, you're not gonna see TJ Warren do this or this, but you're going to see this and this. He knows how to use what he's given. After all, what good is a 40 inch vertical if you can't do anything productive with it? Let's move on to skill set. TJ Warren's biggest asset, even back when he was a college player, was his finishing. He's got a really quick first step, he finishes well through contact, and he's got a really good touch around the rim. His touch has also given him a fairly unique go-to move, which is his floater. Sometimes it's a little bit difficult to tell what's a floater and what's a layup, and I know people have different definitions of this, but whatever you wanna call it, anywhere between the rim and about 15 feet from the rim, TJ Warren can float the ball in. And this is also something that he was really good at in college. For whatever reason, he just has a knack for these shots. Now, the reason why you don't see many players take shots like these, uh, well, I, I should say, the reason why you see less and less of these shots in the NBA is because usually they're less efficient than obviously a three-pointer or a layup, but also a proper mid-range jump shot. But TJ Warren is quite efficient from that area despite how he shoots it. And we now have a pretty big sample size to prove that. Let's take someone like LaMarcus Aldridge, who was one of the best mid-range scorers in the NBA. He has been for a long time. This season from 10 to 16 feet, which is the area TJ Warren likes shooting these little floaters, from 10 to 16 feet from the rim, Aldridge shoots 41% this season and for his career also 41%. TJ Warren from that same distance shoots 42% for his career and 43% this season. Compared to a three pointer or an inside layup, these shots again are not efficient, but sometimes the defense forces you to take these shots. And in those cases, TJ Warren is one of the better finishers in the league from that middle area. Now, what about TJ Warren as a defender? Well, this is where it's really hard to analyze TJ Warren individually because the Suns as a team have been atrocious for the last four years. Specifically, they've been really bad defensively. And when you have a team that is so bad defensively, no individual player on that team looks good, either by defensive metrics or by the eye test. I've said this before in previous videos, and in some cases, it might be a bit of an overgeneralization, but defense is much more team oriented than offense. There's also the general issue where players, when they're playing on a very non-competitive team, they take defense less seriously. It happens to a lot of guys and TJ Warren is no exception. From the film that I've watched, he certainly looks disengaged defensively on certain possessions. Although again, on many of these possessions, his teammates also look uninterested in playing defense, especially this guy. He can ball watch and forget his man, and he does have trouble guarding the top tier guards in the league who are too quick for him. But other times when he's engaged, TJ Warren is a pretty good on-ball defender. He's got the right frame to defend any three or four in the league. Much of this, we'll just have to wait and see. When the Suns become at least somewhat competitive, like when they maybe start contending for the playoffs, when as a team, they start to figure out their rotations at the very least, that's when we'll get to judge TJ Warren somewhat independently as a defender. Now, given his skill set both offensively and defensively, Warren can play either small forward or power forward. In today's league, he's almost better suited to play the four position where he can hold his own defensively while taking advantage of more traditional power forwards on offense. The issue with the Suns though, is that they actually have a huge log jam at the forward position. You got Kelly Oubre, who's also kinda interchangeable, Josh Jackson, who's, uh, who's really not a good enough player to have a position. <laughs> That sounds really harsh, but he does almost nothing productive offensively. I suppose given his size, he's like a four, especially since he still can't shoot. So yeah, basically a four. And then Mikhail Bridges, the rookie who's had really good moments is kind of a three, could also be a four if he bulks up. Now it's obvious that out of these four, TJ Warren is the best player, but someone's gotta go eventually if they wanna split the minutes right. And just on a side note, if I had to guess, Phoenix will probably let Kelly Oubre walk in restricted free agency if some other team throws a lot of money at him, or they could try to keep him, 
or they could try to keep all four, but if Mikhail Bridges starts developing and needs more minutes, Josh Jackson will probably have to get traded or get demoted further down the bench. But what we do know is that Booker and Aiton are Phoenix's core moving forward, and TJ Warren fits nicely with both. But really what matters is his fit with Aiton specifically. While Aiton certainly has ability to score outside the paint, he's best inside where he puts his 7 foot 1 frame to get used, and he needs spacing around him to work. Again, this is where a non-shooter like Jackson becomes problematic because Jackson's defender can essentially play free safety and roam around the courts without fear. TJ Warren is a great indicator of where the league is going in terms of what kind of players are going to succeed. If you're a perimeter player, you have to be able to shoot threes. There are exceptions. If you are so talented, so good with the ball, so good at creating offense, you can maybe get away without shooting threes. The two most obvious examples of this are Ben Simmons and Giannis. A slightly less obvious example would be someone like DeMar DeRozan. But even in those scenarios, those guys all need to be surrounded by shooters anyways. You don't get to become a 19 point per game scorer just by shooting threes. You have to take advantage of closeouts and mismatches. The Suns run plays for TJ Warren coming off screens, but they run way more action through Booker. In those cases, Warren and any other player in his shoes as the third or fourth best player on the team, the way they can still impact games offensively is by giving space to the guy with the ball. And should the ball come to them, they have to be ready to shoot or drive or get a shot off quickly. In the big picture, I'm not quite sold on Devin Booker being the number one option on a championship team for reasons I might talk about in the future. I'm not even quite sold on DeAndre Ayton being the second best player on a championship team. But for what it's worth, I'm pretty sold on TJ Warren as the third best player on the championship team. Don't underestimate that. Plenty of teams have fallen short of winning at all because their third or fourth or fifth guy wasn't good enough. I think TJ Warren will be one of the few bright spots for the Suns moving forward. Phoenix is still two years away from uh, being two years away, but at least you got him under contract for an undervalued 10 million per year for the next four years. All right, that's the end of the video. See, I made you watch, I made you watch an entire video about the third best player on a garbage team. How about that, huh? Now, if you'll excuse me, I'm going to work on my next video about Enos Cantor, which will be titled, Meet Enos Cantor, Sean Kemp with a 10-inch vertical. All right, that's it. Bye-bye.